Wow, what a night last night. You were on fire, man. Where did you get those moves? Pow, cha cha cha. What? Oh! Don't do that to me. You freak me out every time you do that. Knock it off. Pretty proud of yourself. About last night? Yeah. About last night. Oh, come on, relax. Nobody knew me there. We've been through this before. That's not the point. Listen, don't start this morning, okay? I'm not in the mood. Not in the mood? Speaking about in the mood, are we going to church this morning? Oh, look at the circles under my eyes. You think we're going to church? Listen, we decided that we were going to go today no matter what, remember? Yeah, you know what? That was before the fiesta last night. <laughs> I just, I don't know. I got some church on TV. It's the same thing. You know, I've seen a big difference in you since you stopped going. Oh, blah, blah, blah. No, no, I mean it. You've really changed. You know, tell me in the Bible where it says that I need to go to church anyway. All right. Hebrews 10, 25. Let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another. Forgot about that one. Yeah. And besides that, if you're a Christian, you should want to go. But you know, sometimes I don't want to go. You should go anyway. It's a positive influence. It helps you face the week. And it shows you that you're not alone. Now maybe if some of the people at the party last night knew that you went to church, you may have been a little more careful. You know, Sunday's my only day to sleep in. Aw, oh, so what? What a selfish thing to say. The Bible doesn't suggest that we go to church. It tells us to. I didn't mean to get this far away from it. I know you didn't. So, let's go today and we'll see how you feel. Do we have time for breakfast? Yeah. I'm cooking. Your waffles are horrible. So we are going. Yes, we're going. Finish getting ready and we're right. leaving. But, uh, I'm driving, all right? Whatever, get moving. Last week, Pastor Chris introduced the Stop Going to Church series, and as a part of that, he highlighted the fact that many of us as Christians have access to a wide variety of excuses about why we can't make it to church, why we can't make it to life group sessions, why we can't make it to the training sessions, why we can't really gather together outside of church. We live these busy lives, and eat. yeah. Many of us have access to a lot of those excuses. So just as a means of review, I thought we'd start today by identifying some of those excuses Christians use. And what better way to review them than to put the excuses in the mouth of the one who is the source of these things. So just a moment. <laughs> what? What? So, so you don't think the devil's the type to wear sunglasses inside? I, I suppose you think he's going to show up in your office or your room or your living room or your kitchen in the morning with a pitchfork smelling of sulfur going, I'm here to tear your life apart. You, uh, any good Christian would be ready to say, whoa, no, I don't think so, right? So when the devil shows up and has these little discussions, especially about church excuses, he usually disguises himself as an angel of light or a wise counselor, only concerned for your best. So see if you haven't heard these things whispered in your ear. Are you ready? Now, I know you're committed to Jesus. There's no doubt about that. But have you considered whether it's really necessary, really necessary that you attend church this Sunday? After all, it is your only day to sleep in. God certainly won't dock you points for getting some well-needed rest. You can catch up anytime you want by watching the sermon video on the church website later. You know, you can catch all of Pastor, Pastor Chris's stuff then, right? So you really don't have to feel pressured to hear the message today. And let's be honest, you know, you could always go out on some podcast and hear some great preacher with a great accent. 
I mean, really, why do you got to settle for just the local talent, right? It's all there for you. There's no lack of opportunity. And, and you know, that life group meeting, it'd probably be good for you, but it really does conflict with your family time. And we know God's big on family, shouldn't you be too? While you're thinking about it, let me also suggest, between you and me, you know that group of Christians you've been gathering with. And you know they've just been going through the motions anyway. All smiles, and I'm fine, and holy halos, but you know full well, and I know too. They're just faking it. Praise God this, and how are you doing? Find that. And who wants to have to hang out with people like that? We need authenticity anyway. What difference will one hour make with your spiritual life? With your personal relationship with him, you can spend all the time you want during the week just talking with God, just you and him, having a great time together. Why let people distract you from your focus on God? You and I both know you could use a break from those songs that you don't like. The same old ones they sing over and over. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. <laughs> hey, I think missing church will refresh your spiritual life too. Have you thought of that? Isn't it getting a little dry and dull? Maybe sometimes you just need to step away, get a new perspective, sit quietly in your living room with a chair watching Bowling for Dollars. It's amazing how the Holy Spirit can speak to you in those moments. You have thought about all that, have you not? And oh, besides that, it's lousy stewardship to let that boat sit idly in the garage while you go sit in some worship service. God gave you that boat. Don't you think he wants you to use it? And since I've got you anyway, the neighbors are not happy about your lawn. It'd probably be a good time for you to catch up. What kind of witness are you showing with those weeds? Doesn't Jesus want you to be a good witness in the community? So, what do you think? How about we just pass today? Now, am I the only one? Or have you heard that stuff? It's pretty powerful stuff. It's so powerful that there, there was a screen that popped up here. Now we'll put it up here if you put this next one. This is a... Uh, bulletin inserts has appeared in countless churches' bulletins, so let me throw it out to you. We're going to have a No Excuses Sunday at the church, and the way we're going to make sure that we take care of all the excuses is we're going to do the following. Cots will be available for those who say Sunday is their only day to sleep in, so we're going to put some cots <laughs> out there. Eye drops will be supplied for those who have red eyes from watching late night Saturday night TV, TV shows or that fiesta thing that that guy was doing. There will be steel helmets for those who say, the roof would cave in if I come to church. Right? So we'll make, make sure that I can honestly say in my whole history of, of ministry, I've never heard of a roof caving in during a worship service. I'm sure it happens somewhere, but I just, I, not during my services as far as I'm aware. Always the first time. Okay. Blankets will be provided for persons who think the church is too cold. Fans for those who think it's just too hot. Right? Scorecards will be offered for those wishing to list all the hypocrites present. And we know there's a bunch of them. TV dinners will be made available for those who can't go to church and also cook dinner. I would say, hungry man, TV dinners. Enough to really feed you, right? We're going to make sure we provide those. I like this one. Finally, the sanctuary will be decorated with Christmas poinsettias and Easter lilies for those who have never seen the church without them. We laugh, yes. How about those excuses? Have any of us ever used those excuses? How do we handle those excuses? Well, let me start with the word of God. It's a great place to start. Knowing our temptations, knowing it's human nature to look for ways out of involvement with church and involvement with church groups, God gives us a command. This is not a suggestion. This is not a good idea that Christians ought to follow if they can put it into practice. This is not a good, wise counsel for those of us who in a pinch need to have some wise counsel, but other than that, it's just good guidance. This is a command from God. If you put this next one up. God's response to our excuses is we are commanded to gather regularly as brothers and sisters in Christ. We are commanded to gather regularly. 
Take a look at the passage that was quoted in the video earlier. Let's look at it a little more fully. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. I love that word. Spur on to love and good deeds. It doesn't say hug one another on to love and good deeds, although that's cool. It's a very, very at least a little bit of a painful picture. We're going to gather and we're going to spur each other on toward love and good deeds. Not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day approaching. If we deliberately keep on sinning after we've received a knowledge of the truth, no sacrifice for sins is left, but only a fearful expectation of judgment and of raging fire that will consume the enemies of God. Now that's worth the whole sermon. That last phrase, that's worth the whole sermon by itself. What I want you to note is the command to meet together regularly is couched between two very serious statements in Scripture. My suggestion is the thing in the middle is important too. Notice what it says. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess. If we deliberately keep on sinning after we've received the knowledge of the truth, no sacrifice for sin is left. And by the way, in the middle, don't give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. I am convinced that meeting together means at least coming to church. At least, I'm also convinced it's a lot more than that. In the scripture, meeting together is meeting together for worship services, meeting together for fellowship times, meeting together in our homes, sharing together. The early church understood that, right? You know from Acts chapter 2, how they met together daily in their homes. They shared together. They shared life. Not just, oh, it's Sunday morning, we've got to get our hour in. They understood they needed to keep connecting and meeting together together and God says that's a command serious stuff heavy stuff and it raises an important question and it's a fair question to ask and it's the one that's on many people's minds when they start hearing about well you got to go to church what is the big deal why is God so hung up about this meeting together staying together what 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 is the I, I can tell you this because God said so now does that inspire you God never tells you something just because he wants you to behave and he said so. It doesn't work for parents either. You notice that? You can try that with your kids. Because I said so. That's why. Well, I'll see. <laughs> says your kid. Because none of us do much very long because we are just told we have to. You ever notice that? None of us. There would better be some sort of reason behind it. And God never wastes time telling us this is important for you to do without a because behind it. So the question we need to answer is, why is it so important that God would say there are no excuses? Why is it so important that we gather together regularly and meet together regularly that God would say you must not come up with excuses for how to avoid this because it will hurt you? The good news is scripture gives at least three that I want to share with you this morning. Why is this such a big deal to God? Number one, it's a big deal to God because the Christian life is not a religious activity. It's about relationships. The Christian life is not just a religious activity. It's about the relationship net that God has given us to share it in. It's not a private pursuit of checking things off my checklist. Okay, my religious life. Okay, trying to get to church when I can. Okay, good. I'm a, I'm a pretty good person. Yeah, I'm giving some money. Yeah, okay, I'm trying to be better than the average bear. Yeah, okay, good. That's me and God. How many times have you heard somebody say, this is just between me and God? That is so sickeningly American and so sickeningly unbiblical. It is because of our sin. I got my right. I got my right to live my Christian life my private individual way. My Christian life is none of your business. Brothers and sisters, somebody better read scripture. Because your Christian life is my business. And my Christian life is your business because we're the light of the world. We're the salt of the earth. We are meant to watch each other's backs and spur one another on and spend time together. There's no such thing as individual Christianity. It's sad that the metaphor that some people have for this, take a look, is this. <laughs> Recognize that guy? Some of you are going, who's that? I don't know who that is. What is weird with that picture? What happened to the color? Okay, yeah, right. 
That's called black and white. <laughs> this is us, a wonderful metaphor for Christianity for many Americans. I pull myself up by my own bootstraps. I handle my eye with a high O silver and a praise the Lord. I live out my Christian life on my own efforts, and I have no responsibility to anyone else. You're, it's not your business. It's me riding alone into the sunset. <laughs> How could that be? How have we gotten to such a messed up place that we can go, we can nod heads when people go, well, you know, you know, I'm a Christian, but I just kind of live it out by myself. I just kind of live it out privately, and we all nod our heads, going, well, I guess that's your right. Well, it's their right, but it's not biblically right. Where'd they get that? I mean, even take a look at the next picture. Even Lone Ranger had Tonto. Even the Lone Ranger realized he wasn't supposed to be lone. How many times in these shows, for those of you who watched it, I, I, what, that, a few, you, like three or four of you are higher than 55 in here. <laughs> How many times did Tonto bail him out? And he knew it was a good thing he was around because he understood even the Lone Ranger doesn't do it alone. Brothers and sisters, Christianity is extremely clear. Scripture is extremely clear. This is not an individual religious enterprise. This is a relational endeavor. How do we know? 30 plus one another is commanded in the New Testament. 30 plus. I won't bore you with all of them, but I am going to share some of them so you can get a feel for this. Put these up here if you would. I'm not going to read the references. You can see them. I'm just going to read them. You listen to this voice of the Holy Spirit speaking through his word. A new command I give you. Love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Honor one another above yourselves. Accept one another then, just as Christ accepted you, in order to bring praise to God. I appeal to you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another so that there may be no divisions among you and that you may be perfectly united in mind and thought. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. Speak to one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Sing and make music in your heart to the Lord. Submit to one another out of reverence to Christ. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up, just as in fact you are doing a few more. Brothers, do not slander one another. Carry each other's burdens. And in this way, you will fulfill the law of Christ. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility, consider yourselves, consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. And here's the one from today. Let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Let us not give up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. And as that flows over you, I'm going to make a well-duh statement. You ready? Here it is. You can't one another without another. Hello? The relational connection we have with brothers and sisters is in the very fabric of what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. You cannot divorce the Christian experience from meeting together regularly. Or this one another stuff is a waste of time. I'm telling you, God didn't waste the ink. You were intended to have another's to one another with. And the place where you find them is you meet together with brothers and sisters in worship, in services, in life groups, at home. You invite them over to your house. They invite you over to their house. Well, why do I have to do that? Because you can't live this life without it. What are you thinking? Not you, but Christians, you know. <laughs> what are we thinking? Let me try it another way. You've seen me put this picture up here before. That's you in the middle with the smiley face. Can't you tell? You're happy today. I've shown you this net before. 
The Christian life's not about a bunch of do's and don'ts. It's about a relationship, net, a relationship up with God, in with brothers and sisters, and out with seekers who need to meet Jesus Christ. What I want you to notice in the middle is something I call the peanut butter toast chain. Christians are meant to have peanut butter toast chains. Paul, Barnabas, Timothy chains. In every Christian's life, you were never meant to be the Lone Ranger. You were meant to have Paul's, Barnabas's, and Timothy's. You were meant to have a Paul in your life. Have you identified someone in your life who you've gone to them and say, I need to meet with you, and I need to spend time with you because I see Jesus in you, and I want to learn from you. Would you spend time with me, just share with me your experience in Jesus and show me what you've learned because because God's called me that I need a mentor. I can't do this alone. The Barnabases, by the way, are the people who are on the ride with you. Your fellow sidekicks, the way I define Barnabases is they're the people who have permission to do two things. Encourage you when you're down and kick you in the pants when you need it. I am stunned at how many of us as Christians have nobody to do that. Because we haven't opened our lives to relationships. Because we think this is a private Christian or a private enterprise. And we have not spent the time to build relationships with trusted friends, Barnabases, who can look us in the eye. And when they say, you need to keep fighting, we hear it. And when they say, you need to stop that, we go, whoa, okay. You have permission to do that. In fact, you aren't the ones, right, who go, how dare you say that to me? That's not your right. Oh, yes, it is. Consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Whatever that spurring means, it doesn't mean I've got to be nice, sticky, sweet honey all the time. Sometimes you just need a good, swift kick in the pants, amen? Not you, but... <laughs> and who's doing that? Who, who in your life have you built a relationship with as a Barnabas? And here, this one's missing entirely from the Christian life in many people's lives. Who's your Timothy? Who's the person you have chosen relationship? Say, I want you to meet with me regularly. I want you to spend time with me, and I want to build Jesus into you. I see Jesus in you, and I want to coach you along. It is, I get a little wound, no sir. <laughs> we need peanut butter toast chains, and most Christians do not have them. And it is the primary reason for the lack of reproduction in the American church. We are not reproducing corporately. 80 to 85% of all American churches are plateaued or declining in attendance. And among those that are growing, they're growing, borrowing from other Christians who are leaving other places to come to this place or that place instead. And we are not we're reproducing individually. We're not discipling or being discipled. What we're doing is just drifting around, disconnected from others, hoping somehow God will bail it out somehow. Not you, but Christians you may know. Am I the only one in the room? It's the American way, brothers and sisters, and we got to fight. Because otherwise we'll just drift right into it. You see, God doesn't tell you to, to meet together regularly just because he gets a kick out of watching you behave. He realizes that the very essence of the Christian life requires a relationship net. The very essence of the Christian life requires brothers and sisters watching each other's backs and sharing. It's hard work. It means decisions. It means time priorities. But we cannot choose to allow ourselves to be separated out. Let me give you another reason. We need relationships. Number two, why is it such a big deal? Because there's power in corporate worship and prayer. There is incredible power in corporate worship and prayer. Listen to this passage from Revelation. It's not up here yet. You can save that slide till next. I'm going to read this one. Verse 11, chapter 5. Then I looked, and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne, and also of the living creatures and the elders, and their number was countless thousands plus thousands of thousands. And they said in a loud voice, 
Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and everything that's in them saying, Blessing and honor and glory and power be to the one seated on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshipped. Won't it be awesome to be in that context someday? Brothers and sisters, you are in that context today. Gathered for corporate prayer. I want you to notice this. This is another well, duh. But I want you to read this carefully and find the place where it says, And I, John, went to heaven and saw a worship service where thousands upon thousands were waiting in a queue, a line, at the door that said, Throne Room of God. And one by one, they were being let in to have 15 minutes of personal worship each. It doesn't say that. Now don't get me wrong, personal worship is marvelous and wonderful stuff. But let me tell you, as great as you think it is that you can sing, Bless the Lord, O my soul, at your kitchen sink, there is something about joining with a group of believers and doing it that just has power. So the ultimate reality that John sees is not individual Christians worshiping God one by one in in, in a long circular line forever and ever. What he sees is a group of people worshiping corporately because there's power in corporate prayer. There's reality. How many of you can think of a a, a time in in a worship service where you sense the presence of God in a way you never had before? Why? Because there's power in the presence of God among his people. How can you live separately with that? I don't care how much Bethel music you listen to in your car or how much you listen to Elevate. Fantastic, but we need these times. Because there's power in corporate prayer. Look at how Jesus puts it. Truly I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, this is one of those verses worth a whole sermon. All I want to tell you is don't you think people would listen closely to what he says next? Again, truly, I tell you that if two of you on earth agree about anything they ask for, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For wherever two or three gather in my name, there I am with them. What I want you to notice is it doesn't say what we all know is biblically true in other cases. Can you meet by yourself with God? Of course you can. Are you encouraged to do that? Of course you are. But notice that when Jesus is speaking of it in this case, he says wherever there's something about the synergy of relationships. God is a relationship freak, and we're intended to connect. We're intended to spend time together. There is power in corporate connection, power in prayer. Notice where it says, again, I tell you, if two of you, I said, right, well, what? If only one of us prays, you don't listen? <laughs> no, but his point is, I, I would not think that anyone would misunderstand, but I expect we're all gathering together, and we're praying together. The early church understood that. Watch what happens. They get together and pray regularly, and as they get together and pray regularly, awesome, big, huge things happen. Let me prove it. Next, next, yeah, there you go. They all join together constantly in prayer, along with the women and Mary and the mother of Jesus and with his brothers. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. So they're gathering together as a group, and they're praying, and it says, all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. The church is born in a context of corporate prayer. Next one. When they heard this, this is, this is, in this situation in chapter 4, they've been threatened to, sh- the uh, uh, leadership in Jerusalem of the, of the religious leadership has told the Christians, shut up or we're going to make life really miserable for you. It says, when they heard this, they raised their voices, what? It doesn't say, when they heard this, they sent out a prayer text and everyone went to their, corp- or to their private prayer closet. I'm just telling you what, of course, the text would have been hard. I don't know if they had fiber optic yet. Now, is it important? you got to hear me. Is it valuable for you to pray and for us to send prayer texts? I'm not against prayer texts. Fantastic. I hope you do pray. Hopefully, hopefully it actually happens. What power there would be if we actually joined together corporately, even if it was apart from geographically. But the point is, notice, 
It's the corporate praying together that after they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. Next one, Peter is in jail. He is going to be executed the next day. God intervenes and releases him. We pick up the story. Then Peter came to himself and said, now I know without a doubt the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me from Herod's clutches and from everything the Jewish people were hoping would happen. And when this had dawned on him, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, also called Mark. Listen, where... Many people had gathered in. It isn't that individual prayer is ineffective. It's that corporate prayer has an amazing track record in Scripture. That as we join and agree in prayer. Why? Because the nature of the Christian life is relational. There is power, not just in our prayer closets, which is powerful, but together as the people of God praying. You're hearing me right. I'm not telling you to stop praying in your prayer closet or stop praying personally. I'm just saying make sure you're praying corporately. <laughs> there's power in worship and there's power in prayer when we meet together. Okay, a third reason why this is such a big deal to God. Why does he say you need to not give up the habit of meeting together? Because we need each other to step into our places of service. We need each other to step into our places of service. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, God unpacks through Paul a description of how he gets the church equipped to do ministry. And in that passage, he says that he is going to give everyone a manifestation of the Spirit. We call them spiritual gifts. They freak everybody out. That's worth a sermon sometime. Not they don't freak you out, but they freak some people out. God says, I give spiritual gifts Teaching, administration, mercy helps so that the church can be accomplished. But the really important verse, chapter 12, verse 7. To each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for personal glory. Now, to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given so I can go, woo I got one too. No. It says, now to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. Huh. For the common good. What is assumed in that statement? That there is a common. That there is a body that we're ministering in and with. <laughs> that we're not lone rangers. With that in mind, he goes on with this passage. But in fact, God has placed the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If there were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts but one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. But God has put the body together, giving greater honor to the parts that lacked it, so that there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. Now listen, now you are the body of Christ, and each of you is a part of it. They aren't separate from each other. So if we do not meet together, the body is missing an elbow. Try to eat dinner with that. If, our, if you're not here, there is a chance that the ministry of the church has been diminished to the point that we do not have your gifting functioning in our midst. Statement I have at the bottom. We need you here because you're indispensable. <laughs> My favorite illustration. It's an old story. You've heard it a hundred times. But, but bear with me. It's a good illustration of the story. New yep, there it is. You know the story. New communities being built, probably a lot like what's happening out there by Concord. For those of you, you know, they're building, putting in new streets. And one day, some of the residents see a van pulling through the community, driving slowly, stopping at each, each area where there would be an intersection. A guy gets out of the van, two guys actually, they get out of the van. One guy starts digging, and he digs a hole. And he's sweating, and he's working. The other guy's kind of out there. He's getting other things out of the truck. He's actually getting a bunch of quick, dry cement out of the truck. Bags of that. He's got a wheelbarrow. The, guy, the first guy's digging a hole. <sighs> they, they, he, after he gets the hole done, he stands back for a minute, and the two guys stand there for 30 seconds. 
Then the guy with the cement pours the quick dry cement into the hole, pours water over the top of the hole, right? And they now have a hole with a bunch of cement in it. And they pack everything up and they get in the van, they drive to the next intersection. They do it again. Guy gets out, fights, digs a hole. They wait for 30 seconds. The other guy pours a bunch of cement into it. They get it all wet. They put it all. Okay, the, the, the neighbors are now beginning to gather. They have a little bit of a question, right? So they stop this after the several times they've been doing it, and they ask this team, what in the world are you doing? He said, well, we are installing stop signs at the intersection. But the guy who puts the sign in the ground and holds it while we put the cement in is out sick today. Oh, Jeff, it can't be that important whether I'm in this or not. Jeff, it can't be that important that I miss. No one notices. No one will care. Jesus says, you are the body, and every one of you is a part of it. And I cannot accomplish the kingdom purposes if we're not going to have you with us. Strong enough? <laughs> I made you indispensable. So let's do a quick summary. We must gather together regularly. Because God said so. Well, yes, he did, but that's not the reason. That's not the reason. The reason God says so is because relationships are vital to the Christian life. Because we need the corporate experience of God's presence and power. And because the body needs all parts present to function as God intended. Hence... All of the effort expended by the evil one to convince us not to gather. He understands the implications. And the best way I can describe it is to give you a picture. This picture. What you are seeing is a wolf pack hunting. And they have separated out what looks to me to be either an elk or a caribou. I'm not a great animal person. Large deer. <laughs> the way that wolves hunt is they realize you don't go diving into a herd of animals. They tend to kill you and trample you to death. So the way they work is they will circle a herd of animals, and they will stir them up. And what they are watching for is so that they can get one of them isolated out to the side because if they can get them isolated out to the side, then they can gang up like this and begin to nip and begin to grab until they get that animal weak enough to come down and then they can kill it. I don't think it's any accident that when the word wolves comes up in scripture, it's usually referring to the negative work of people working on behalf of the evil one. It's the evil one strategy, brothers and sisters. Let me put this next screen up. This is war, brothers and sisters, and the devil's scheme is to isolate and nullify. That's how he does it. He wants you not meeting together. Because if he can get you not meeting together, he can get you isolated out all by yourself and begin to pick at you and damage you until he takes you out. And if he can't get you killed, he can at least keep you nullified. He can keep you from being effective in contributing to the kingdom purpose. Why would we lean into that? Why would we help him? We fight back by making gathering together our priority. Yes, God said so, but we know we need it. We need brothers and sisters. We need to have that experience of something bigger than just us. Sharing together in something bigger than just me. Reminding myself that I'm not the center of the universe. God is. And we do that by meeting together and reminding ourselves that all of us have a common king to honor and then we share in ministry with each other and serve each other as we trust each other in relationship. Ecclesiastes puts it this way. 
Two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. If either of them falls down, one can help the other up. But pity anyone who falls and has no one to help them up. Boy, that's the definition of the American cultural landscape. We are so connected, and yet we are so disconnected, that when people crash and burn, they just come off by themselves and die out there. And the worst thing, have you ever been, not this church, of course, but have you ever been in a church where they go, wow, I didn't even know they were struggling. Huh. Right? Because either they allowed themselves to get isolated. I think it's a partnership. They allowed themselves to get isolated out, and we as brothers and sisters did not chase and say, what's going on? I'm going to challenge you. I'm going to spur you. You don't have to come, but you're going to, have to, you're going to have to deal with me saying, I think you should. Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands is not quickly broken. It's Ecclesiastes chapter 4. Let me close with this statement to all of you. We need to be able to look at each other and say, I'm with you and I'm watching your back. So my question to you, is there someone you need to call? Is there someone you need to connect with? Is there someone you need to invite? Well, I, that would be uncomfortable. Yeah, them dying out there alone to a pack of wolves because they've been isolated and nullified would be uncomfortable too. pretty strong. Is God challenging you to a fresh commitment to be there and take part and get involved? Can we say it together? I will not be absent from the battlefield while others are under attack. I will not let anyone allow themselves to be isolated out and destroyed one by one. We are in this together, and I will show up, and I will connect, and I will not forsake gathering together. I am in this with you, and we will watch each other's backs. No excuses. No regrets. Heavenly Father, I am a massive introvert. No one believes it, but I am. And I know the sunglass guy. He comes to me more often than anyone probably would even guess. And he says to me, really, do you need to do that? Do you need to make that connection? Do you need to spend that time? Do you need to meet that person? That's going to take time. He runs all the excuses, and I nod my head yes. And Forgive me, Lord. Remind me and remind all of us freshly, you don't tell us to not forsake meeting together because you get a kick out of watching us behave. It's essential. It's essential to what you are doing in our lives. So give us the courage when the excuses pop in to say, I know what those are. Those are excuses trying to steer me away from the things that are important. And I will not be shaken. I will not be separated. I will not be isolated. I will be in this with my brothers and sisters. Do that for us, Lord. Speak to our hearts and give us the courage to respond as your spirit.